Thank you for being here for the third day of the conference, the critical task of the university. I'm very glad and uh, grateful to have been invited here, and I would like to thank Rosy Braidotti, Judith Butler, and Raffaele Laudani, and all of you who are here. I'm especially grateful to be chairing this session, and uh, I thank uh, Stefano Hani, Tiziana Terranova, uh, Emanuela. I always voyage. <laughs> And um, I think we have to start. I just want to say that uh, up to now, I've been learning a lot of things concerning definitions and methods and systems of analysis concerning critical thought and the role of the university. What is the stake and what it was the stake was something which is very, very simple, but also very, very important and complex. What do we mean by a university? is something which goes back to the European legacy or is something which we look forward toward the future? And uh, what do we mean by critical uh, thinking and critical task of the university when we think about the outside and the inside? Uh, political activism inside and outside the university and I think it's very problematic to still deal with inside and outside university because I think that university should be considered as intrinsically part of, uh, of society. And uh, what is also the task of the university in terms of uh, universitas, universitas, universal, uh, does exist the possibility of a universal or maybe better a, a, a common basis, a common ground, or we should start it from the local, trying to give voice a space to, so to speak, marginalized uh, knowledges. Question of powers. And I think that uh, uh, also the word global should be rediscussed, and I think we, will, we are going to discuss it also today. And uh, neoliberalism, uh, communism, uh, capitalism, all words which have, we have tried to define. And uh, in the end, I think that we are here. Uh, really we need to reflect upon these terms. We need, uh, because as we know, we are giving definition is part of the critical task of the university, not for the sake of it, but to put them in a the context where we live. And uh, I think that uh, I was really uh, struck by some questions which were raised, raised. And is the university a place of consolation for the intellectual? Or is it a space for the reaffirmation of a certain politics of affirmation, not only of the university, but of society and different groups of people. And uh, in this light, I think that today's uh, uh, talks uh, will address uh, important issues such as teachings in a sharing and communal uh, task and technology of the university, meaning that technology, not in terms of techne, technique, and systems of organization. And uh, I think that given the technologies we are talking about, universities should be redefined and reorganized. So thank you for being uh, here. I will give floor to Stefano Hane, who teaches at Singapore Management University in Singapore. I know everybody knows him, but I think we repeat something you already know. He's co-author with Fred Moten of the Undercommons, Fugitive Planning and Black Study. And most recently, together with Moten again, of use, uh, use, fract, use fract, future of black in future of black radicalism and intent to serve the debt in public servants, art, and the crisis of the common good. He curated the show Shipping and the Shipped at the Bergen Assembly Triennial in 2016 as part of the Free Thought Collective. With Tony Castilli Thompson, he runs the residency and study project Ground Provisions. Thank you for being here. And today, he will be talking about a partial education. Thank you. Of course, I'd like to thank the organizers to begin with uh, for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here, and I've learned a lot in these last two days, so I'm, I'm really grateful for the invitation. Um, and I didn't know, but it was a special pleasure to end up on a panel with Tiziana, whose work has been very influential uh, on me for many years, really a lot of years, me and my students. I can remember very distinctly coming out of seminars uh, in which we studied her work and we were really 
really changed by it. So it's great to be um, on the same panel. Uh, and I'm happy to be going first so that I don't have to go after her um, and try to match what, what she will say. Um, and also my new friend Rita and my old friend Manuela, whom we've known for many years. So uh, it's been kind of a treat for me um, to, to find myself here at this moment. Um, I'm going, I have a paper that I, I will read, uh, but I will outline it for you a little ahead of time in case, um, like me, you drift off during the reading of papers. Um, at least we'll um, be able to pick it up at the end. Um, this is work that um, I'm doing with, with Fred Moten, so it's uh, based on a, our ongoing collaboration. and. Uh, I've taken some of the ideas that uh, we've been discussing recently and tried to work them into a discussion about teaching and where I find myself doing my teaching right now and what it means to be doing this teaching. And that's what I'm going to meditate on a little bit in this uh, uh, session with you. I think what I wanted to try to get at in this discussion is why it feels so unsatisfactory for me to um, encourage my students to become critical thinkers. Um, and this is a familiar and mundane thought for most of us who are teachers and most of us who study with our students that um, the more critical and more creative we make them, um, the better for capital. Uh, and indeed, many of our universities um, have what they would today call a value proposition based exactly on that fact, um, that we're going to produce for you students who are creative, students who are critical. So in thinking about the title of the conference, uh, I was reminded of some of the ways that this feels unsatisfactory to me to be in this moment. And for me, this is doubled because um, I don't, I teach the humanities, but I don't teach in a humanities department. I teach in a business department. And I've taught in business departments in the UK, in the US, and in, now in Singapore for the better part of 12, 15 years. Um, and yesterday, a few people mentioned, quite rightly, that we should keep an eye on the relationship between the humanities and the rest of the university when we speak. Um, and it's certainly worth reminding ourselves that in a place like UK, according to how you measure it, something like 40% of all the undergraduates are studying business or a business-related subject. Now, business-related is a little tricky these days for anyone who's stuck teaching something like a creative industries course or something. Um, so who knows where the line is in many of these things. But many of us will know in our fields that um, business as a subject seems to creep in in all kinds of ways. Suddenly there's a new postgraduate program that seems to combine our subject with business or suddenly we're um, asked to fill out um, something like graduate attributes which seem to be geared much more towards business than the subjects we thought we were talking about, etc. Um, so, you know, if you're, I often say if you're interested in teaching, as I am, you know, business schools is where the students are, you know, and, uh, and by and large, my experience is they're getting a pretty appalling education in those business schools for the most part. Uh, so naturally, in that kind of situation, you're thinking to yourself, oh, well, I'm going to come in and save the day, right? Because, you know, they're just, they're just taking a miserable version of accounting, which doesn't even teach you about accounting, right? Um, and of course, that's precisely the wrong impulse, and it's an impulse in which somehow you get caught up, and then uh, maybe I should say I get caught up, and then suddenly I'm faced with this question of um, how what I've introduced to these business students becomes part of the value proposition uh, for the university and for these students. Um, and what to do in that kind of situation, how to avoid 
any number of pitfalls that um, arise at that moment. One common one that I encounter a lot is a, a, a way in which one ends up on the other side from one's students, uh, saying to them that they've made a mistake to be studying what they're studying, uh, saying to them that they, they don't understand uh, the, the big picture, uh, saying to them that um, you can lead them in some other kind of direction. Well, this is also a horrible place to find oneself from my point of view. So then the question is, how, how, can, how can I be on the side of my students in these circumstances where we are faced with the antagonism of this business education um, and where what I seem to have at my disposal um, seems really to have no effect uh, on the, on the um, enemy. Uh, so it's with some of those thoughts in mind that, um, that I've used some of the conversations that Fred and I have been having to, to write this uh, paper that I'm going to present to you now, um, which started with the title A Partial Education, but it's now called uh, Algorithmia, um, playing on the founder of the algorithm. Uh, what, what else should I say about it before I start? You can see I'm worried about reading a paper because I just keep talking, but uh, I, uh, some of the touch points for it um, are thinking about teaching Kafka with my students, but especially thinking about a film called The Watermelon Man, which is a film that Melvin Van Peebles made, um, African-American director of the 1970s, very important political director, very independent. Before he became this independent director that we know, who has this now quite large influence on more contemporary African-American directors, he was actually in the sort of studio system. He was offered this three film deal. Uh, and the first of these films was The Watermelon Man. Needless to say, the other two films never happened when this came out. Um, he took a script that was given to him uh, and he reworked it uh, into a, a rewriting of Metamorphosis, um, of Kafka's story. Um, I'll say more about the film uh, as it goes on, but the premise of it is that a guy wakes up one morning in his white neighborhood with his white family, with his white job, and he's black. Uh, and gradually it becomes a meditation on passing because we discover actually he was black all along. Uh, and also it turns out it's kind of a meditation on logistics too, believe it or not. Um, because in the beginning of the film, <laughs> it's a strange, it's really, it's just a really weird film. You should try to see, it's on YouTube. Um, and really interesting. At the beginning of the film, they show him like at the beginning of an average day, he sells insurance or something. And it's a perfect little family in the suburbs. But he has this very strange habit where he uh, gets up, puts on his suit, gets his suitcase, you know, kisses his wife, all these things. And he puts his running shoes on. And rather than walking to the bus, he races the bus uh, through a number of stops in this neighborhood with his briefcase. And in the movie, all the people on the bus are watching him and they're, they're rooting against him <laughs> not to make the bus stop. But of course, he's actively involved in, in a routing exercise, right? I mean, this is a logistical exercise for him in which he's cutting through neighborhoods to say this is a faster and more efficient way. Sure. I'm sorry, Rosie. Sorry. Um, as some of you know, it's, it sounds different up here, so um, thanks for the reminder. So he's sort of making his, his own bus route along the way, let's, uh, a more efficient one. Um, and of course, as the film um, evolves, we, we start to see that a number of ways in which Melvin Van Peebles is playing with um, issues of race and racism in the, in the, in the film, but also uh, the, the key thing to say to you to sort of set up part of the paper is that um, 
in the script, the studio and the, and the, and the, um, and the screenwriter have the guy go back at the end and become white. So it, um, it fits in another American tradition of, uh, of, of somebody coming in and out of a, a, a character or a situation. And Van Peebles refuses that. Um, and in the end, instead, he's training in a kind of quasi Black Panther um, configuration uh, at the end of the film. Um, and I'm going to try to use that refusal uh, to talk a little bit about um, some questions of access and logistics and routing um, and to try to think if I could find a better way to work with my students um, that didn't appear to just be training them through criticality and creativity to be yet more open, more accessed uh, by capital. That's sort of the premise of this. All right, let's get to it. Um, <clears throat> the, there's a quote at the top of it from Marx, uh, volume one, where he says, the collective working machine becomes all the more perfect the more the process as a whole becomes a continuous one. Um, like a lot of Marx quotes, this seem to me incredibly contemporary. Um, I teach a class called the Capstone at Sing Singapore Management University. It's a final fourth year course. My students are business students, accounting students, economic students, and a few social science students. The capstone introduces students to thinking in the humanities, somewhat paradoxically in their final year, which in this case is the fourth year. But the premise is that thinking with these texts will allow students to reflect on their four years at the university and think about the paths upon which they are about to embark. I teach figures like Marx, Freud, Kafka, Fanon, mixed with uh, more contemporary Asian thinkers and artists like Kuo Pan Kong and Arundhati Roy. It is, all of it, pretty much new to these students, and, and it seems that they enjoy it, and I certainly enjoy it. In fact, at the end of the course, I've usually had such a good time that I, I want to give all my students marks that reflect their enthusiasm and their efforts, uh, but I can't do that. I'm restricted by a suggested grade distribution. I can give at most 35% of my students A's. I've tried to argue that as fourth year students, they might be said to have reached a level of competence where more of them should receive A's, and that these marks should reflect our successful efforts over four years to educate them. But I was missing the point. Our students will never be competent. There will always be need for improvement, for continuous improvement, in fact. But that's not quite right either. There are instances where my students are competent. At the moment they're presented to employers, they're presented as highly competent. At the moment they're admitted to the university, they're accepted as the best and the brightest. These moments are real, but the moment of grading is equally real. This alternation between praising and upraising the students is in fact uh, continuous in their university careers. It forms the medium of their daily life at the university. Around them hang posters of students who've achieved everything. Images of students who found good jobs with an accounting firm, but they've continued their, their drumming or their cycling careers on the side, or students who swam with dolphins while also on a coveted internship in financial services. These students hang in banners from the walls of the university. This exaltation of the students is one they themselves are supposed to embrace and embody. Courses on leadership, on negotiations, and indeed my capstone are supposed to foster this exalted self. But this is only half of what SMU calls its value proposition. Students must also submit themselves to constant evaluation of their value. They are to be measured and graded competitively against each other and against the future. And as much as they go into the competition with the confidence of being designated as amongst the best and the brightest in Singapore, there is inevitably something degrading about the subsequent evaluation, about the assigning of values to each of them, about the valuation they undergo. Their efforts are turned to numbers, and the numbers are aggregated, ranked, 
And as anyone who's ever received a plea for a change of grade knows, this leads to a neurotic mix of hubris and shame in the outcome. But it's not really an outcome. It is indeed a value proposition. It's a promise of future value. This proposition is always unproven, however, almost always unfinished, and therefore somehow also, I'd say, improper and indecent. What is on offer is a student who's been both exalted and degraded, who's capable of this oscillation between the two, the student capable of leadership and subservience. The student's, student embodies that phrase, a USP, a unique selling proposition. A unique selling proposition offers the purchaser a chance to buy something unique, just like everyone else. As I was writing this, I was reminded um, of this uh, oscillation between um, the sort of leadership and subservience that we encourage in our students. Uh, and um, I was watching in the United States this ridiculous testimony of, an, of the FBI director against the president and the weird oscillation that he went through, you know, between his evil leadership self and his evil subservient self in that testimony. Um, and it was all a little bit too clear to me at that moment. Anyway, when I teach the capstone, I often want to give out all those A's, not because I'm sure that each of my 40 students in each of my four classes <laughs> deserves an A, although sometimes they get a sense of this from reading individual papers and assignments. Rather, I get a feeling the class is going well, and I sense that we're creating some novel ways of thinking about our situation. But when it comes to grading, I'm forced to individuate that feeling. But it really is an individuation within a set, a set of A students and B students and C students. And it's not just that I'm forced to do it. The students want the grades, the good grades, because paradoxically, this evaluation stands for a level of access to their more exalted side as supposedly displayed in that room. But of course, that exalted side was not what was on display. It is, in fact, a degraded complement to the grade, the individuated, reduced version of what we had together. Nevertheless, access itself is not mere subservience or submission to logistical demands. It involves precisely this oscillation a willingness to be valued for degraded purposes, a promise to offer a wealth of access points. The instruction in creativity and criticality is precisely for this invitation. The student will submit to the firm, but that submission is a good value proposition for the firm because of all the ways a creative and critical student can be accessed. When I give out too many A's and the dean's office writes a uh, quote unquote request uh, that I moderate the grades in my capstone, I don't actually have to do anything. I just go online and I press a tab called moderate grades. An algorithm does the rest. It's not the first time and it's certainly not the last time that my students will be graded by an algorithm. In grading them, I've already taken all my exhortation at creativity and criticality and all their efforts at uniqueness and authenticity and reduced them, made them a number and a set. Those with A's will then step forward, exalted again, individuated still. But those without A's will also be exhorted to step forward, to react by asserting their subjectivity as a way to make the next grade. This subject reaction, as I'd like to call it, is provoked by this continuous measurement. Of course, the Western subjects is hardly new or unexamined, but this subject, or subject reaction, has been sped up in its oscillation by the algorithms, and especially by the way these algorithms have been put to work, or at least that's what I want to try to consider here. The continuous demand for access, the continuous use of our means requires the constant reassertion of our individuality, not least because it is this individuality we sell for its parts. That is, it is our personality or purported subjectivity we sell to be accessed in many ways as we can. The subject reaction is the only way to get paid. Classically, classically this subject reaction, as, uh, as Fred uh, has said elsewhere, operates between exaltation and shame as it confronts the fact that its higher truths of the mind as a supposed subject must be delivered through the baser senses, through the body. 
Some of this classical bourgeois subject reaction may operate in my students, but mostly they're just trying to pull themselves together in the face of what we will call these logic, logistical demands. So in what follows, I want to look at what Fred and I call the dematerialization that produces this subject reaction. <clears throat> Both my critical efforts in the classroom and my grading may well be part of this dematerialization, as are these logistical demands. Such a dematerialization has deep roots in Western tradition of positing a subject and its mind. But today it's at work most frenetically and most visibly or maybe invisibly in logistical capitalism powered by the algorithm. Logistics today puts us in movement and in contact as never before. It makes us a means as never before. It opens access everywhere and in everything. But at the same time, logistics degrades those means and denigrates this access by driving them always towards a single end through valuation. And that end, of course, is profit. Yet by tapping our invaluable means to do this, logistics also confronts what Fred and I have called elsewhere our logisticality, our capacity to be a means for itself, for our already entangled partial selves. Indeed, we read the rise of logistics and the subject reaction that it encourages and instructs as attempts to regulate our logisticality, our means of movement, our movement as means. Logistics seeks to impose a position, direction, and flow on our movement, on our pedacy, our random walk, our wandering errancy, to trap us in this oscillation, this neurotic pacing back and forth. Logistic wants to position us to have us take a position to fortify, to settle us. And yet logistics itself also has to keep moving, even in its degraded way. This is where the algorithm gets put to work. My students and I are in the right place to study this laboring of the algorithm. We study Marx on alienation, and we try to study Marx on the senses, too on how the senses might become theoreticians in themselves, as Marx tried to, tried to suggest to us. Logistics requires us to use our means, and our senses have long been understood as the means to knowledge, but not often as ends in themselves, as theoreticians in their own right. Logistics intensifies the opportunities to live a sensuous collective life that is immediately material in its means and as its means but logistics also wants to dematerialize our means, to abstract them and submit them to the concept, the concept of valuation and the concept of profit. And most immediately, it wants to submit our means to the concept of flow. We could well have studied Marx for this insight too. He predicted that flow in the capitalist production would become increasingly the focus of productivity efforts and would increasingly contribute to profit. But even if we did not study his predictions on flow in our capstone course, and we didn't, Marx has anyway been taken up and dematerialized in the business school by the discipline of operations management. And so now I'm going to take you on a brief detour through operations management so that you never ever have to do it yourself. <laughs> um, and I hope it's not too long of a detour, but it, you know, it's the heart of trying to get a sense of some of the ways this oscillation, this paranoid back and forth begins to take shape um, against our, our efforts in the classroom sometimes. Looking at operations management in a way it would not look at itself, we could say it's a capitalist science that studies the relationship between variable and constant capital in motion. <clears throat> Operations management understands itself as the science of the factory and especially of the assembly line and even more particularly of what we might call after Marx the flow of the line. The flow of the line, by this I mean operations management attention not to workers or to machines nor even to the relationship between the two. Other management sciences focus on variable capital like organizational behavior or human resource management or on constant capital like accounting, as if accounting actually does that, which it doesn't, but anyway. What characterizes operations management is attention to a certain kind of motion. 
not the assembly line then, but the assembly line motion, inflow. Operations management focuses on workers and machines as they appear along the flow of a line in order to make that flow line flow. In other words, the flow of the line mediates the relationship between worker and machine and determines the proportion of variable and constant capital, not the other way around. For operations management, the relationship of man to machine means nothing in itself. They're indifferent to it. But the relation of man to machine to the flow of the line, and particularly to the, the motion of that flow, means everything. In other words, attention to process. And, and, and uh, you know, I, I don't really know how to tie this in, but it occurs to me that uh, thinking about Kafka again, that process can mean trial in German. Maybe somebody smarter than me can figure out how that's connected here. <laughs> and, and, more, and more recently to the continuous improvement of that process is the real object of study of operation management. Operations management organizes dead and living labor, not just on the flow of the line, but directed towards the quality of that flow, focused on the process of flow, not the product of flow. A machine or a worker is not judged independently, but only in service to that flow of the line, in submission to the process. Improvement in quality in operations management is not, despite its own rhetoric about products, is not, despite its own rhetoric about products, about improvement in pro, uh, about improvement of products. It's about um, improvement of the process. The product is really of no interest, including what Marx teaches us is the first product, the workers who will find themselves under the subsequent regimes of operation management forced into the same subject reaction as my students to keep the process going. With continuous improvement, it will be clearer than ever that the worker, like every other commodity, everything, will be dishonored and discarded for the sake of the flow. In itself, this frank indifference to both worker and machine and even product, um, it doesn't make operation management uh, more honest, let's say, than other um, business uh, disciplines. But you could say that by contrast with human resource management or organizational behavior, there has to be some investment in what today would be called human capital, even if investment is akin to the encouragement I give my students in the classroom to express themselves. That is part and parcel of this dematerialization that makes the flow work and the work flow. But even these other disciplines in business bear the mark of this flow. In the discipline of strategy, the leader is exalted. While strategy's other half, decision making, deploys algorithms that expose that leader as a subject reaction to the flow. Operations management is different only in that It started with no such mediations. The emergence of operations management, uh, as with all the disciplines in business, can be traced to class struggle, although the popular story of its rise omits this foundation. According to the popular narrative <clears throat> recited in textbooks and in journalism of the business press, it was the emerging threat of Japanese competitiveness and what would become called Toyotaism that focused uh, minds in the United States on the importance of quality and consistency in highly durable goods. This is supposed to have given rise to a much more scientific and a much more respected uh, field of operations management. In this story, somewhat implausibly, this rise of quality uh, in Asia is then attributed to American business consultants this popular story is so preposterous that even business historians, not given to radical dissent, cannot condone it. Yet year after year, something called the Deming Prize it continues to be given out. The Deming Prize was in fact given out since 1951 and recognizes individuals or organizations for outstanding efforts in what is today called total quality management. But when the prize started, it was simply called quality. In fact, its creation was part and parcel of the efforts of imported American business consultants led by a man named W. Edwards uh, Deming to promote quality control in Japanese businesses after the war. 
The common narrative begins with these American business consultants who were said to break through the collectivist culture of Japanese workers at the very moment when post-war American industrial relations were allegedly characterized by such collectivism in the legacy of New Deal compromises on collective bargaining and productivity agreements. In the early 1950s, Deming and his colleagues introduced quality management techniques in Japan, and this, this part of the story is true, that aimed to make individual workers responsible for the smooth functioning of their part of the assembly line, in other words, for its flow. And there were two components to this responsibility. One was reducing mistakes that impacted on the quality of the product. This was, I'm translating this language. If you go look at the operations language, there's sort of a discourse for it. So it's a bit of a rough translation. This was said to be done by making each worker responsible for those mistakes. The other was improvement or speeding up of the line of the flow. What quality management sought to do was to individualize the speed up, in other words. A big part of this was decollectivizing resistance to that speed up. The result was a worker caught in an oscillation between submitting oneself to the line, to the flow, and asserting one's individuation as a quality controller. The flow continued to be a force well beyond the control of the worker, but rather than responding to it with another collective force, the worker now uh, was individually responsible for her or his response. Nonetheless, despite the pressure Deming and other American overseers placed on Japanese workers in industry, productivity in Japan, contrary to this preposterous story, didn't improve at all during those years. The experiment was a failure as a productivity tool. But that's not to say it was a failure. Um, it turns out that it's going to have some uh, some real usefulness a little later on. At any rate, in the case of Japan, as, as we know, what, what actually happened was uh, the tried and true American economic technique. It put Japan back on a war economy, first with the Korean War and then with the Vietnam War. And they used all the client states in Southeast Asia, sometimes even also denying American uh, producers uh, and exporters um, to say, you got to buy Japanese first. Um, and that's, you know, that's a pretty big part of the Japanese miracle. People will debate how big a part, but one thing there's not really much debate about is that total quality management plays a very small role in that. <clears throat> However, though Deming and the company had nothing dem demonstrable to do with this miracle, they were in the right place at the right time when American business needed its own productivity solution. The oil shocks of 1973 and 1978, themselves part of a complex class struggle in the oil producing region as the Midnight Oil Collective uh, taught us, they do not bring forth higher quality, more reliable Japanese durable goods, products of this alleged management miracle, but cheap cars with better fuel efficiency. And these cheap cars appear amidst another class struggle not unrelated to the one in the oil fields. And it's here we pick up the threat of operations management and its latent power as a class weapon. For while there's no evidence that total quality management, as it came to be known, was in any way responsible for the Japanese miracle, it was a useful tool in disciplining a collective moment in Japanese labor. Thus, in the 1970s, with the final breakdown of productivity deals in the U.S. amid wildcat, st uh, wildcat strikes and the rise of organizations like the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in Detroit's auto industry, American management was looking for a new form of control. It's here that the failed management theory of Deming and Company, burnished by the rise for very different reasons of the competition in cars, electronics, and machine industries with Japan, finally had its day. Kaizen <clears throat> means improvement um, in Japanese, also I believe in Chinese. Use in operations management in Japanese car factories, the term designated not just improvement, but continuous, unceasing improvement as the responsibility of each worker on that flow line. With the advent of Kaizen philosophy, the flow was never good enough. As the leading Japanese popularizer of the term, in the English-speaking world at least, puts it, Kaizen means continuous improvement by everyone, every day, 
everywhere. With the rise, of, the rise of Kaizen meant there would no longer be the pursuit of what Frederick Taylor used to call the one best way. Measurement, which had reassured us that we'd found that best way and we had completed a job, would re be replaced, as, as we've spoken about quite a bit in this conference, by metrics, powered by the algorithm. With Kaizen, we could say valuation shifted from the product to the process. A product has a value that can to some extent be measured in a price-making market. A process <clears throat> has a value that can only temporarily be read. Process has a contingent value. It's a process of value. This is why a financial product would better be called a financial process. Its value rests on ongoing metrics, or perhaps we should say its value never rests because of ongoing metrics. Mechter is here practically a quantum mechanics based in part on an uncertainty principle. And a name for that principle might be efficiency. Nothing, nothing can be deemed efficient without giving rise precisely to the question of its efficiency. So I'm, I'm suggesting to you or playing with the idea that this term efficiency might, might be a kind of uncertainty principle at work and in work. Operations management turns its attention away from efficiency measured by profit realized by the commodity as in the one best way approach and toward the efficiency of process, efficiency as process, measured only momentarily. Continuous improvement meant that each efficiency became inefficient the moment it was measured. Gradually measurement itself became inefficient and was replaced by metrics, a relative taking of a measure that benchmarked the flow only to speculate on it using the algorithm. The, bull, the goal became for the flow line to outperform itself. Or in other words, with Kaizen, the goal became a speculative flow. Of course, there's long been a drive in capitalist firms for relative surplus, and even longer, there's been the pressure for efficiencies from capitalist competition. But with Kaizen, attention to the flow of a line for its own sake becomes paramount, and efficiency becomes attenuated from anything like measurable competition or market mechanisms. Continuous improvement made speculative finance possible. Kaizen not only predated contemporary speculative finance's entrance into the factory gates, but crucially it served to link speculative finance to assembly line productivity. Now the flow of the line itself represented potential. The assembly line became speculative, or rather its flow did. Accounting shifted to include metrics for it, this speculative line, and finance moved in in force. Everything was sold off and rented back. Sorry. Everything was sold off and rented back. <clears throat> Firms and later banks were hauled out in this process, but not empty. This was not a matter, as sometimes portrayed, of firms becoming victims of financialization, just the opposite. Kaizen made financial speculation possible. What remained in the firm after financialization was the speculation on the flow. The term used for this speculation on the flow was core competencies, or sometimes the infamous competitive advantage, which despite the name was not about competition at all, and today reappears as value proposition. All of these management concepts emerge to signal that a firm's management team has a method for improving the flow of the assembly line, any kind of assembly, any kind of line, to get more value out of workers by intensifying access to them. The reason to invest in these evolving resource-based firms was no longer because they held certain assets or made certain commodities, but because they and their management demonstrated the capacity to improve the flow of a line continuously through this deeper access to workers, whether through technology or workplace culture. The means of production itself entered the speculative realm with Kaizen. Today, this logic culminates in the private equity firms who, with complete indifference, buy, disassemble, and reassemble business processes, not businesses. So this is half the picture, and I will, in the time, do I have, what's, how are we doing? Oh, I have five minutes. So I'm probably going to um, chop out some of this, but I'll just try to put together the other half of the picture, because at a certain moment, um, operations management um, 
takes under its wing as a discipline um, the field of logistics. And with this, what we get is the coming together of two kinds of flows. The flow that we associate with what goes on inside uh, a factory or inside an office, and the flow of what we associate of uh, resources, uh, materials, uh, labor that have to come into that site. Um, these get linked and they get to some extent harmonized and they certainly all become the subject of uh, common speculation. So I'll, I'll see if I can get through this piece a little bit uh, more quickly. All right, thanks. Of course, um, improvement has always been speculative and speculation, despite today's rhetoric, has always, however hidden, been about the possibilities of labor power, whether the farmer's capacity to improve land or the slave's capacity to exceed her insurance. It is in this context that Fred and I have spoken of usufruct as the coming together of two kinds of improvement, the improvement of the self and the improvement of property in the late 18th century, early 19th century. In particular, we were led to this by a passage in Hegel speaks about Yusufruk in the philosophy of right. He speaks about it as a placing of two wills in one property. He's just completed a discussion on slavery, and, and though he no, makes no mention of human property, and indeed his discussion of slavery is about ancient slavery, he makes no mention of human property, but it's impossible not to read his passage as a, emanating from some kind of contamination of his master and slave narrative by the second meaning of improvement. Yusufrak was not just the working of another's land, but of another. And the wills that clashed in the matter of improvement were now propelled by capitalist accumulation and demonstrations of self-issuing will bound together. Yusufrak was itself never going to be done, and there was always another property or body into which one needed to place a putatively independent self-improving will in order to improve that thing. This speculation on the line resulting from Kaizan, the brutal decollectivization and individuation of that line, this is at the same time a psychotic demand for access to the individuated worker, has its origins, uh, we might suggest, in uh, slave labor farms producing cotton in the United States. This is brilliantly shown in a new book by Edward Baptiste called The Half Has Never Been Told, in which he and details the ways in which with the rise of the cotton plantations in the um, west of the Mississippi, a new form of management developed um, for overseeing slave labor. Whereas uh, in the eastern parts of the United States, um, one typically found uh, gangs of enslaved people uh, harvesting rice uh, or other crops. With cotton, we get, first of all, very clear physical lines of cotton plants. Secondly, as Betty shows, we get a new system of, that decollectivizes work groups. What the overseers would do is they would place the best and most able cotton picker at the front of the line, and that person would be driven to collect as much cotton, it was usually a he, as he could. Everyone else had to follow in that line. He essentially set the, the pace for improving your ability to uh, pick cotton at that moment. But what was interesting is Baptiste uncovers the, the forms of discipline that made this line work. Many of these forms of discipline were alien to the enslaved peoples who were used to some forms of clandestine cooperation uh, and, and other forms of resistance together. The punishment for helping someone else with how much cotton they collected was far more severe than the punishment for not collecting enough yourself, far more severe for weighting your own bag down with a piece of fruit or anything else. It was the most severe punishment of all. Uh, it was a brutal effort at decollectivizing the slaver as a way to emphasize individual improvement. Um, and one can feel some of the echoes uh, in management today of, of these um, original techniques. 
The Empire of Cotton not only hosted these fiendish early experiments in breaking collectivity on the line, but also gave us an early glimpse of an integrated global supply chain. The breeding and marching and shipping of slaves from the East Coast slave farms to the co cotton slave farms west of the Mississippi, because the older plantation economies by 1800 began to uh, make the majority of their money by selling their slaves westward and often marching them on long, uh, brutal marches to get west. All of that, the movement of that labor, the barges of cotton loaded onto ships from Liverpool, the wholesale clearing houses, finance and insurance, the whole global value chain, all weaved together by these, you know, the bloody fingers of factory workers, uh, factory owners in England. <clears throat> but it's only in our time that this integrated supply chain becomes fully integrated with the flow of a line inside the factory gate. Around the time that operations management was coming to understand Kaizen and the valuation of the flow of a line itself, it was also rethinking the linearity and the finitude of that line. It's at this point that a new subdiscipline in operations management comes, uh, becomes firmly established as a rigorous academic discipline, and this is logistics. Of course, logistics had already existed as a practice going back in military affairs, as long as there have been sieges, invasions, forts, food, water, and weapons, and people had to be transported and maintained to support any such strategy of war. The African slave trade represented the great hideous introduction of mass logistics for commercial rather than military or state purposes. It became the ghoulish lab of experiment and access for the singular means, the degraded means of work and sex. Much would follow, including infrastructure projects like canals, railways, and of course, more mass displacements, indentures, migrations. All of this logistics would not only bear this trademark of the continent of origin in the slave trade, but with Yusufrek, the improvement of flow would become indistinguishable from the production of racialization. Whiteness would become that property of or as self-accessing means for this flow. Or to put it another way, whiteness becomes the, the self-improvement uh, of the flow. Blackness became what it already was, the prior interruption, the sabotage to come, the incapacity to breathe into the flow as a capacity for breath as means, for the breath of means. Containerization and extended value chains of global production and markets turned study of this flow into an academic science, and that science is practiced within operations management. As a result, operations management came to see the inputs and outputs moving in and out of the factory as extensions of the flow inside and outside the factory. Paying attention to these extensions can improve the flow inside the factory. Logistics, reverse logistics, user communities, relationship market came to be seen as part of a continuous process that could be continuously improved before inputs entered the factory, while they were transformed in the factory, and after outputs left the factory. And obviously I'm thinking of my students as already being integrated into this flow um, each time we reach uh, reach for a book and, and try to develop our critical sensibilities. Logistics has long been a place uh, of experiment and algorithms centered around the traveling salesman problem, concerned not just with the most efficient route, but the most efficient adaptation on route, as for instance in the Canadian traveler problem, where logistical routes change unexpectedly, of course, because of snowstorms. What logistical theorists sought from the algorithm was continuous recalculation, metrics not measurement. In the genetic and evolutionary generation of algorithms, they believe they may finally have eliminated what they themselves call the controlling agent, living labor, or what they also sometimes refer to as the problem of human time. Things would talk directly to things in the fantasy of of logistics theory, a fantasy that some of us might recognize from, uh, you know, the Internet of Things or other uh, developments. I, I give a section here on synaptic labor that I, I won't read, and I think what I'll do is just kind of give you a bit of the ending that I hope I can pick up if anybody's interested in discussion.
Now, I, th I think that one of the things that concerns me is that the subject reaction, based as, as it is on a prior dematerialization, can never produce the full refusal or sabotage or indirection necessary in the face of logistical capitalism. Though it is a reaction to the degradation of means, it is itself and its individuation a degraded reaction. But what synaptic labor does begin to make clear in any kind of subject formation or individual identity dematerialized from the general and generative ecology of the society of labor under logistical capitalism it's already bound up always with this value chain of brain, mind, identity, subject. In contradistinction, in contradistinction and as ever, black maternal monstrosity, or what um, Arthur Jaffa calls the abnormative, living the flesh, a collective sensual life, emerges in what Fred and I have called the hapticality of the ones called upon to assemble this flow, the ones who flow whose flow runs underground and overhead and under common. This is the uncontrollable improvisational effect of a general and material communicability or entanglement. This is a living poetic communicability traveling some other lines, riding the blinds in nobody's country. Gregor Samsa was a traveling salesman. In Kafka's Metamorphosis, Gregor's body is accessed in the most complete way. But the irony, of course, is he's so accessed, he cannot move or allow the further passing through of the flow. At the same time, he cannot accede to the monstrousness of his body, though this might be a way for him to take access in some other kind of direction. His only idea, and that of his family, is that this, must, this monstrosity must be dematerialized. Gregor, Gregor the subject must return. He must react or die. One can contrast Gregor then with the lead character in Melvin Van Peebles' uh, Watermelon Man. Every day he races the bus in a self-directed act of root efficiency in his white suburban neighborhood on his way to sell insurance. But one day he wakes up black. What he eventually learns, however, is that he was passing. He was always black. The script called for Van Peebles to turn him back to white at the end to enact the subject reaction. Van Peebles, of course, is having none of that. Van Peebles leaves the character in the transformation that has caused screeches and of fear and horror all through his route as he runs. Moreover, Van Peebles presides over the character's embrace of everything that would make him a horror to his previous life. When I read Kafka with my students, I'm thinking to myself, how can we read him like Van Peebles reads him? How can we see that we're passing? Instead of urging criticality and creativity into their value propositions, how could we start to see that what kills Gregor is access, not his immobility? How could we make a monstrous distortion, a spreading bullwhip in the flow? How could hapticality step out on criticality? How could we join a general strike against calculation, against valuation? Such a general strike would not so much be an event as the emergence of a general condition of exhaustion, a radically impure form of productivity? How could we study live in the flesh as a refusal out of mind in the schizophrenic break, not in the flow? How could study move without position? How could we make study overflow, working together by any beat necessary, hip hop? Thank you. Thank you, Stefano, for this very intense uh, talk, and thank you. I think we will have a lot of things to, to reflect upon and to discuss with you. Thank you. And now, Tiziana Terranova, welcome. Uh, Tiziana Terranova is Associate Professor in Cultural and Media Studies at the Università di Napoli, di Studi di Napoli, l'Orientale, where she is also a member of the Centro di Studi Postcoloniali e di Genere and founder of the Technoculture Research Unit. From April to June 2017, she's a Fulbright Distinguished Scholar at Northwestern University. Tiziana has been the recipient of no, numerous fellowships and has participated in a number of international research projects. She's the author of two books, Corpi nella rete and Network Culture, Politics for the Information Age, which appeared in Italian as Cultura Network, per una micropolitica dell'informazione. Her book, Hypersocial, Network Cultures Between the Market and the Common Infor 
is forthcoming from the University of Minnesota Press. She has published numerous essays for edited collection and peer-reviewed journals, and she's a member of the editorial boards of the journal Theory, Culture, and Society, Studi Culturali, New Formation, Fiber Culture, and Subjectivity. Terranova recently edited a special section of Theory, Culture, and Society on Euro Crisis, Neoliberalism, and the Common, and the end chambers, special issues of the journal Anglistica on inflection of technoculture, biodigital media, postcolonial theory, and feminism. Thank you, Tiziana. And today, Tiziana will talk about the post university as a common fair institution between social cooperation and technological mediation. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Thank you very much um, about this uh, introduction. Uh, and thanks to the organizer of this uh, conference for, for inviting me. I'm, I'm very honored to be here and to be given the opportunity to uh, share you know, some of my uh, thoughts uh, with you. I uh, was really glad to be on the same panel as Stefano as well. Uh, because I, I, you know, I, I keep reading his work, uh, you know, his own work together with uh, uh, Fred Mota and find much inspiration in it. And I was very glad to have had the opportunity to read your paper in advance because I think it's a, you know, it was a great paper and I really enjoyed just being able to read it slowly. <laughs> And yeah. uh, because I got, I got a lot out we of it, you know, it you in terms did. also the, this relationship between measurement and, uh, and matrix, uh, I think it's a very useful distinction that you make, and also the influence of operations management uh, uh, in this kind of logistical uh, model of production that we are all uh, involved uh, with. We talked about it uh, uh, before in terms of the relationship between the, the seven bridges of Kenningsberg. Uh, graph theory, social network analysis, uh, and how, you know, all of that is kind of converging in this model of government. So I was also wondering, and I would like to share this with you before I start. First of all, how can you hear me? Yeah, because we have a bit of a problem. In this, and well, yeah, because I was wondering uh, what kind of room was this? You know, what was it used for? It, it seems to me like, I don't know about the history of this place, you know, what was the, the activities that used to be carried here. It seems to me like uh, a room for whispering, <laughs> you know, where people whispered. Maybe it was for kind of parties where like deal were broken, yes? Interpretation of meanings. <laughs> it was a? a prison. It was a prison. A prison. It this was a prison. A prison. Strange to think of this as a, this room, you know, what the kind of function, this was a kind of administrative maybe part, very interesting. But you know, the, this combination of this architecture and the, the kind of ecos that we are getting and that you, you know, the kind of podcast uh, uh, set up, um, these microphones, uh, you know, it just really reminds me of the university today, with just this juxtaposition of such heterogeneous uh, spaces, right, and, and, and times, and we're just living in this just a post uh, uh, epoch. So, uh, yeah, so it seems uh, this kind of patchy uh, construction, heterogeneous uh, uh, space that we're living in. So, uh, yeah, I would like to start uh, uh, talking about the paper I wrote and sent in advance and then rewrote and then decided to just work with the structure because I feel more comfortable with it. Uh, and I would like to uh, start uh, uh, this paper about this notion of the post-university between technological mediation uh, and uh, the notion of social cooperation and common fair by talking a little bit about the state of things, you know, as Deleuze and Guattari used to call them, the state of things right now. The state of things right now, I think it's uh, uh, characterized by like two elements. On the one hand, since 2008, we had the mutation of neoliberalism uh, which has been the kind of mode of governments that we've been uh, that dramatically restructured uh, uh, the university uh, today, and this uh, uh, mutation has been austerity. So we kind of all been living with this kind of uh, notion that there is no money, that uh, uh, budgets needs to be balanced, and hence we have to put up with cuts because that's what kind of good housewives do. You know, they kind of they balance uh, the budget, and that's. Uh, uh, so we need to kind of contain this budget. We've been told that we are an expense and a cost that, uh, you know, we cannot afford. And I say we to mean kind of the nation, 
cannot afford uh, uh, to spend too much uh, on education. Uh, students, uh, you know, not everybody can afford access to education, and if they do, they should choose something which is some kind of return. So we'll be living with this austerity uh, mode. On the other hand, uh, I think it's interesting that the kind of uh, um, the, 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 the kind of curse, you know, that on 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 on, on talking about alternatives on saying you know that this system is not working and, and that there can be some kind of return to socialism although a socialism which it needs to kind of be reinvented uh, which was such a taboo for a long time uh, socialism communism uh, communism you know all these different uh, terms are being used it's been broken uh, there, there was a uh, i think the late mark fisher was absolutely right when starting from his experience of teaching uh, students, uh, he came up with the term capitalist realism uh, in England. And so the idea that you cannot question the way things are, that if you question them, you're ridiculous, so you're saying things that you, you, you should not be sable. And I think that's been played out in the UK uh, quite eloquently in the way in which uh, the Corbyn, which is a kind of old style uh, uh, socialist, uh, uh, really has been presented as a ridiculous figure, has been presented as something which was absolutely unacceptable, something that could never have any appeal, something like a relic from the past. Uh, the same thing, uh, I know less about that, has happened in, with Sanders in the United States. So it's interesting that it seems to be like uh, a popularity of anti-austerity uh, position, an anti-neoliberal uh, position. And I think, although, you know, uh, even as this popularity is predicated on the, on the kind of, uh, on the body or is allowed to a body of the, the kind of white-haired uh, uh, white man, you know, is allowed to say that, uh, but the kind of the body of the head, in a way, is a very young body, because I think it's kind of, the, these, these are discourses which are mobilized uh, and, uh, uh, especially uh, the youth vote, but not only. So it's interesting that we are in this moment. So what I take from that is the notion that we, need, we can be bold, right? We, we can be bold in what we imagine and what we say, that we need to break this kind of, uh, uh, this model operation of power, which is about silencing, which is about saying, these things should not be said, these things cannot be said, you cannot talk like that, because this is the reality. And uh, we should be able to articulate uh, uh, new visions, which do not need to be kind of detailed uh, blueprint of five-year plans, but which needs to have some kind of hold on the uh, reality that we are dealing with, uh, which is a very transformed university over the last 30 years, uh, a system which has more or less proceeded uh, uh, without many changes, uh, you know, around this format of the class uh, and the uh, written paper and the lab experiment has been dramatically uh, changed. I'm sure there's been other breaks in the past, but what we experienced since the late 1980s, uh, I think it's, uh, it's really massive. Two features uh, I would like to uh, um, talk about in relation to this transformation and the way in which they can be thought in, uh, in two different ways. They can be thought as the means through which academic labor has been made docile, but they can also be thought as kind of handles or something that we can uh, turn around to turn them into the possible uh, a model of a post-university, a diffuse university, a university which is uh, not about the, in, you know, the tower, the enclosure, but a university which is kind of almost so socialized without you know, losing its uh, peculiar function. So these two features uh, are, of course, the technologization, uh, so the, 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 the complete innervation of contemporary life uh, uh, in university for students, uh, academic staff, admin staff, uh, uh, professors, everybody is completely uh, absorbed or involved in use of all kinds of platforms. And the other element which is, goes together with this is precarization. Uh, we, have, we are at the point where more than a half uh, of labor, academic labor in university, is performed by uh, staff with short-term contracts, uh, 
uh, who are paid a fraction of the, of the salary of a kind of full prof professor, I uh, was struck by the fact that uh, a, a kind of a, a temporary uh, professor, an adjunct professor in Italy is paid around uh, less than 3,000 euro for a course, which is less than the salary of a, of a full professor, a monthly salary. So this is the kind of uh, uh, political economy of academic labor that we are living in. So the two things, uh, I think, go together. So uh, the original paper, I spent a lot more time talking about the technology element, but I still want to uh, mention that. And uh, I was thinking, uh, I was trying to make a list, right? I'll make a list of all the platforms and software that I use as part of my uh, work of teaching, admin, and research. And uh, I, I'm sure there are more, but I can mention quite a few. Uh, in Italy, we have to upload all our publication on a website or platform called IRIS, which then stores them for evaluation, uh, for, uh, for example, promotions or for uh, the national assessment exercise. These uh, uh, files are automatically copied onto the site of the ministry, which is the MUR which again is an all other set of features, such as allowing you to apply for extra funding uh, for a you know, small percentage of the whole amount of uh, researchers and associate professors in Italy. Uh, I also use YouGov, which is another platform for checking out whether my paycheck has come in and how much money has been taken out this month for various reasons. I also use SF3 for uh, uh, exams and coursework, which is where my students uh, book. Uh, you know, they say when they want to uh, take an exam, they can put their names in there and where I have to input my marks. Uh, I also use, uh, uh, I also access, uh, register myself as an assessor and as a, a proposal on several European Union uh, funding uh, platforms. I used Moodle as part of the e-learning uh, platform in my university. Uh, when I was in the States uh, at the university, I used all kinds of platforms, including Canvas for uh, inputting marks, but also as an alien uh, uh, temporary uh, worker, I also register a lot of data on a lot of platforms. I use academia.edu to kind of share my work. I use Google Scholar. I use Mandalay, which is a kind of social uh, uh, software. I, have, uh, I use WordPress. I have a blog where I can kind of communicate uh, with students. I have a Facebook page for students to keep in touch with them after they finish to kind of share links. Uh, I have a group on Facebook where we kind of manage our research uh, uh, unit. Uh, I use Dropbox folders mm. right, to share uh, uh, reading for my students. Uh, I use the, uh, my own students organize their own Facebook groups and WhatsApp groups related to uh, uh, the group. I, I try to use uh, uh, a Slack for my research, uh, uh, for putting together a research project. We, I use regularly Skype or other kind of uh, conferencing uh, uh, um, software to have uh, group phone calls. And I use also occasionally uh, uh, software such as TitanPad uh, to share, to write, to co-write uh, mm, various kind of papers. So this is a, co you know, it's a, I, I, I think I haven't stopped counting. I think I might have missed quite a few. So there must be between 10 and 20 different platforms and kind of software that I regularly use and without which I could not perform my job of teaching, researching, and, uh, and admin, uh, when I apply for grant or, you know, anything. But there is a difference between these uh, uh, types of software, right? There is a big line running between platforms which I'm obliged to use, which I cannot but use, and which are platforms of e-management, e-governance. You know, these are the platforms which manage the, the kind of flow that Stefano was talking about. Uh, they manage the flow of uh, student uh, and uh, staff, academic staff productivity. These are the platforms where all the data is inputted. And these are platforms, they're also platforms that I don't see but which I hear about. Because colleagues who are responsible for things like course validation, 
uh, have to deal with, this, uh, with these platforms. And these are platforms which, uh, uh, which are composed of parameters, the parameters that a course needs uh, to be validated. Uh, there was a, a kind of really uh, scary equation which looked like some kind of non-linear equation which was circulated uh, some time ago and which was the equation that decided whether a course could be validated uh, or not. And it had a number of uh, parameters which needed to be uh, calculated. So there are all kind of uh, platforms which even once I don't see. I think I've become quite fixated with these uh, platforms because I think they correspond to this process that Stefano was talking about. I think they are the materialization at the level of software and command of these new modes of centralization of command, uh, which is uh, uh, you know, the, kind of the way in which uh, universities today are run. Once you introduce the principle of platform governance, once you introduce platforms which validate courses, validate uh, research, uh, uh, organize uh, teaching, uh, you are uh, putting in somebody's hands the people who are designed these platforms and have access uh, uh, to them in the position to exercise uh, the work of continuous improvement uh, that Stefano was talking about. You know, now imagine that uh, there are two sides between the, the two types of platforms, platforms which are commercial and needs to elicit some kind of pleasure and platforms who, who can um, easily be just about pain because I mean these are like just very painful, this is utilitarian uh, morality. So you, we are becoming used to using social media and to see the new features are added every day. Like one day we wake up and we find there's a pride uh, button uh, on Facebook, right? But for somebody who's on the kind of labor side of that platform, then you can wake up and find that a parameter has been changed for a course that you're validating or for a research project that you're putting together. And this will require to put you a lot of extra work to figure out what it is about, because it's not explained usually, and how to comply with it. So these are uh, platforms of uh, centralization, instantiating a kind of uh, uh, command at a distance or, te or telecommand, and they are, um, function through a kind of uh, intimidation by means of mathematics. This is something that, that we have seen that a lot, algorithms and formula being used to really bully, especially uh, kind of so humanities uh, uh, scholar into complying, into feeling lacking, you know, into the feeling of shame uh, that uh, he was rightly uh, pointing, uh, pointing about. So, uh, you know, with this kind of structure, uh, the ranking of individuals, departments, universities uh, uh, has become uh, a, a kind of, um, uh, the, the, the visible face of all this process of making the university more efficient, you know, making it deserving of the funding that it gets, because this funding is seen as some kind of uh, a gift, right, which has to be accompanied by all kinds of uh, uh, conditions. Uh, we are uh, seeing a proliferation of kind of data collection exercises in the universities uh, and we are asked to make everything we do visible and accountable. But what's interesting uh, when you um, are part of this process is how many things, it's not only what is made visible but also what is made invisible. All the things that are not acknowledged as part of something that makes university work uh, worthwhile of being funded. Right. So uh, the critical tasks of the universities are not considered, at least in the system I know, as something which justifies uh, funding. I mean, there, there's two kinds, I think, what I figured, there is two kinds of uh, uh, activities which are seen as worthwhile of funding. One is, uh, uh, of course, creation of direct economic values, like patents, uh, intellectual property, uh, software, you know, something that can actually be sold in a market. Or otherwise, uh, you have to be able uh, to uh, show that you are somehow contributing to the creation of social cohesion. Some kind of social cohesion, social stability, you are contributing to society, uh, but especially uh, or, or otherwise you are, for example, thinking about the research exercise, which asks you uh, uh, how you are uh, interacting with society by asking you to list uh, uh, 
uh, which events have you organized with the public and whether you've distributed questionnaires. Uh, so all these numbers that you need to add in. Uh, so this is one element uh, of it. And this element of technologization uh, has absolutely got together with the process of precarization. So I think that universities could not hold so many uh, workers who are uh, just coming in and out of the institution or working different sites without an informational administrative structure uh, which can make that possible. And also there is another function I think that uh, precarious workers uh, fulfill in the university. I mean I think they are the kind of abject body, you know, that, that is what is used also to scare tenured full-time staff. You know, the, with the, the, the kind of the threat of replaceability. You know, if it just, uh, it just needs uh, to change the law to make you redundant, and there is an army of younger uh, uh, workers, cheaper, which are already, we can already take, uh, take up your place. So the function is to create also this kind of uh, fear, this atmosphere of fear, of anxiety uh, as well. Oh, with relation to this, how much time do I have? Okay. So, uh, I was thinking, when, when, when looking at these two processes, uh, um, I was uh, uh, really struck, I've been really struck, I've been really listening uh, to my friends and comrades, if I can use this term, um, who are uh, Marxist economists working on the concept of the knowledge economy or on the theories of knowledge economy. I'm really interested in listening to economists uh, I'm interested uh, when I'm actually meeting uh, economists. I know that you work in a business school and you had enough of them, probably, but we don't, we are kind of segregated you know, in a certain way. I'll, I'll, I'm interested in listening to them because it's like you are seeing embodied the kind of knowledge which is completely hegemonic. You are living in a kind of epistemological world which is dominated uh, by economic thinking and it's dominated in particular by a specific school of economic thinking. There's been various uh, good accounts of the purges uh, which have uh, uh, made uh, schools of economics into the kind of one-dimensional, one-theory kind of spaces. So they are like the new theology, really. They're like the core of power. So I'm interested in, uh, every time I meet an economist, or somebody who works closely to the economist, to look at this embodied uh, you know, speaking version of a discourse that uh, we all live by, but uh, you know, I'm uh, help. You know, I find a lot of uh, uh, of ideas and help in listening to Marxist economists uh, today. And I think the Marxist uh, Marxist economists who are not just repeating, you know, Marx uh, uh, words, but they are truly really trying to innovate. Uh, uh, the tools of uh, Marxist political economy to understand what is going on uh, uh, now. So it's not about the repetition of an, uh, another orthodoxy against another one, but again uh, the production of an heterodoxy, uh, both in relation to mainstream economics and in relation to ma uh, mainstream Marxism, so to speak. So I'm really inspired uh, by my uh, dialogues and interactions uh, uh, with uh, uh, autonomous Marxist economists such as Christian Marazzi, Carlo Vercellone, Andrea Fumagalli and Stefano Lucarelli. We've been doing kind of lots of work uh, together, also thanks to Euronomade, which uh, Sandro Mezzadre is also a member of. And uh, uh, in particular, I would like to share with you some of the statements and analysis about the consequences of the notion of the rise of a knowledge-based economy. Uh, in relation to uh, the status of the university. And I like what they're doing because they're not just saying, uh, you know, we can show you a critique of the way things operate, which is always useful anyway, but they're also proposing uh, how, you know, the consequences of the notion of a knowledge-based economy can be turned around to think of another model uh, of what something like univer post-university might be about. Uh, in particular, I always drawn back to uh, Carlo Vercellone and Andrea Fumagalli notion of common fare, or welfare of the common. I found their idea uh, that uh, uh, we need to uh, re-found econo the economy, the whole economy, around the notion that uh, what used to be welfare institution, health, education, 
and research can no longer be considered as simply a cost which uh, society can afford on the basis of the success of its entrepreneurial economy, but must be rethought as the real infrastructure of an economy based on knowledge. So in this, from this point of view, what they argue is that we can think about a reconversion of economy based on the, this new kind of welfare as mode of production. So if you take seriously uh, the notion that we live in a knowledge-based economy, if we take seriously statistics which point out that productivity is no longer linked to increasing amount of things being produced, but the added value is the result uh, of uh, new ideas uh, uh, being uh, tried out, uh, uh, new uh, variations and innovations on existing uh, uh, products uh, being developed, uh, and especially new kind of services, uh, which are not about the exchange of goods, but about the production of relationships, uh, then what these uh, uh, economists are saying, uh, what we're saying is that the whole economy rests on uh, the things, you know, on social cooperation, and social cooperation is something that is best uh, organized uh, according uh, uh, in, to principles uh, of democratic co-participation, and hence what you need is also kind of uh, uh, rethink welfare, the old welfare institution as being infrastructural of the economy, but also think about how uh, you, can, you need to change them uh, to kind of uh, to move them away from the old welfare model uh, based in the, uh, um, in the notion of the public or the state. So I want to unpack that a little bit uh, uh, now. So uh, in recent writings, both uh, Carlo Vercellone and Andrea Fumagalli, Stefano Lucarelli, have been talking about the welfare of the common, of the common fare, as a new mode of production. Uh, they argue that the welfare system contains, in embryo, the possibility of evolving an alternative mode of development founded on the logic of the common, both in relation to the normal production and consumption to those uh, of distributions. Uh, based on the idea that uh, uh, you know, statistics, uh, uh, such as those provided by the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development, uh, 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 even in the context of the current crisis, uh, uh, um, services such as health, education and research are among the few sectors that are still sheltered from the tendency to stagnation. So there is a growth of demand, unlike you know, the idea that we're living in a time of contraction, or even the idea of limits to growth, uh, the kind of the demand for education, for research, for health, uh, uh, for new forms of uh, living together, working together, is not decreasing, but is increasing. It's a sector of, of what used to be welfare institutions, uh, something that a community could afford because the economy went well, they argue has become the basis without which the contemporary economy could not function. So instead of, uh, the kind of the enterprise being responsible for the creation of value, and uh, kind of something like the universities taking a slice of somebody else's work, institutions such as uh, universities, research centers, uh, are where value is created, and the enterprise is where this value is collected and exhausted. So on this basis, uh, saying that we are living in a knowledge-based uh, economy, and uh, the, the, the logic of knowledge production is the logic of the common, uh, Vercellone in particular, uh, has proposed that there are two opposite models of society and regulation on knowledge-based economy, and both of which revolve around the central questions of welfare institutions. The first model is the one that we live in. Uh, Berlusconi makes this interesting argument saying that the reason why uh, the whole thrust of austerity policy uh, seems to be about uh, uh, cutting budgets for universities, for hospitals, for social services, uh, uh, for everything that used to be the welfare component of the state, uh, is not because it's a cost that is not sustainable. It's not because it is too expensive, but because these are 
the, the, the areas where more, which are more productive, where there's more demand, uh, areas which potentially have more growth. So it is the fact that they are growing and not the fact that they are too expensive. It is the fact that they promise more profit because there is demand for this uh, that is at stake, not the fact that they are an expense the state cannot afford. So uh, this is, uh, uh, at the same time, what he also argues is that uh, the, the, the thrust of austerity is extending the logic of profit to the old welfare institutions, because the old welfare institution, from hospitals to schools and universities, where there is growth, this extension is carried out by adopting a model of management, such as the one that is described, that Stefano has described, uh, operations management, uh, algorithmic ranking, uh, uh, you know, all this kind of uh, apparatus that we've been living under, precarization, uh, all these uh, instruments which uh, destroy the wealth that could be created. So, Vercellone is a kind of, um, especially old-fashioned old Marxist from this point of view, is interested in structural contradiction. It's not like, uh, you know, uh, there is a Guattari we're talking about, no contradiction but lines of flight, right? This is what we're interested. But it's interesting the way he kind of frames this, by saying that there is a contradiction between these new forms of management and the social wealth, the forms of wealth that its institutions create, that the old welfare institutions are now creating as a basis of this knowledge-based economy. So while uh, trying to maximize efficiency, we continuously destroy the kind of wealth, non-mercantile wealth that we are creating. So we can uh, uh, you know, have a system which shows, ya, shows us uh, by replicating uh, through all kinds of data collection exercises that we are producing more, that more students graduate in less time, and that's supposed to be desirable. Uh, you know, we can show that we are writing more and more articles. We can show that more and more books are being published, and that which is an index of productivity and of success from the point of view of this uh, logic of new uh, uh, public management which we've been living under, at the same time, when seen from the inside of the floor, when seen as somebody who lives in the floor, it's a huge impoverishment. And this is something that our students also tell us about. It's an impoverishment, uh, and it's also something which fosters corruption. Uh, uh, Vercellano argues that the kind of the importation of this model of for-profit management, this monstrous hybrid of uh, public bureaucracy, a kind of private competition, uh, which we are living under, uh, um, basically creates a logic of rent and expropriation. A logic of rent, la rendita in italiano, means to live off a position that you occupy. So that means that and creates a situation where you have uh, all these key positions which is important to occupy, which could be the editorial board of a, uh, a kind of A-ranked uh, journal. Uh, it could be the head of the, mm, the committee that allocates uh, postdoc funding. The, all these positions that are becoming created, uh, they're being created uh, in this structure. Uh, which uh, uh, allow some people to capitalize on, 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 this, on this rent. And this is the kind of the instantiation of this logic of, of rent. Uh, the other system, so uh, what uh, these authors are saying, uh, they're saying that knowledge-based economy is based on social cooperation. The social cooperation, the logic of social cooperation is based on creation of relationships, uh, is based on creation of things which are other that simply material good, that the welfare, the old welfare institutions, which were the result of the struggle of a previous generation, are at the core of the kind of the wealth produced in this new uh, condition, and that at the same, because they're at the core of this uh, uh, economy, that's where, why they are the target of privatization, but at the same time, that this privatization, even when it's still public poverty, might still be run as if it was a private, a enterprise <coughs> is something that causes a destruction of the wealth uh, that is supposed to be generated. So uh, the kind of the increase in productivity and the, the kind of the, 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 uh, 
uh, money that is being created by all of this comes at the cost of a great destruction and dissipation of energies, of time, of knowledge, uh, <coughs> which could be otherwise uh, produced. Uh, what is interesting is the other model, you know, what do we oppose to this? <coughs> so if we say that we accept, right, it's a knowledge-based economy, so uh, it's no longer about simply the production of goods, but it's an all other element of knowledge production, which is essential to everything uh, that we do. Then, and then we say that this way, this hybrid monster, monster combining public and private, uh, uh, public bureaucracy and private competition is destroying the very uh, wealth that we are supposed to be creating. You know, what do we, uh, what different models uh, can we think? That's why, uh, that's where I would like to go back to the notion that rather than seeing precarization and technologization as the enemies, so the idea of going back to the old system where everybody has a tenured position, everybody is uh, employed in this kind of huge uh, university structures uh, which are still regulated uh, through these uh, hierarchies. What if we, if we kind of embrace this kind of nomadism uh, of that precarization also allowed by taking the vulnerability out of it? So since uh, a key component of the notion of common fare is also the notion of a guaranteed income or, or anyway some kind of the creation of kind of mutual forms of credit, uh, I think an essential component to think about how the university of the common or universities and institution of common fair might work is definitely the creation of financial security and continuity of income for people who are engaged in research and teaching. This could be something that could be complement the notion of a guaranteed basic income. Uh, it could be something that had to do with the creation of uh, insurance uh, uh, institutions. Uh, something which guarantees a social wage, uh, a social wage that needs to be negotiated, which cannot be just the bare minimum. Uh, I like the term that Indy Johar, I was a kind of Asian enter English entrepreneur, used to talk about uh, the kind of social wage, saying it shouldn't be a basic wage, it should be a thriving wage, mm -hmm. like the wage that allows us to thrive. A thriving wage for uh, precarious uh, uh, workers, uh, at the university, which could allow them to choose you know, what kind of, uh, where to work, what to do. That could be uh, a first component. Uh, the second component, which uh, I think, uh, uh, I mean, again, there is a really interesting argument about where to get the funding for this. Uh, there are friends that the Marxist economists are making. They're arguing, again, that the notion of investment is something which is based on previous savings, misunderstand the nature of money today, and that a program which would invest uh, in this kind of uh, social wage for researchers uh, and uh, people who are engaged in higher education uh, would be uh, about credit, about you know, creating money as, as credit, as investment in the kind of wealth that could be generated by this uh, uh, you know, contingent of uh, uh, free, uh, nomadic, uh, or even sedentary if they want to. Noma nomadic, as uh, Rosie taught us, is not about movement in, uh, in space. It's also about an, an attitude about the possibility of leaving you know, something that you're not uh, happy with and also starting something new. Uh, the second element is the technological mediation. Uh, the, the way this infrastructure is being used now as a means of control and command and centralization, uh, which leaves you as feeling this kind of appendage uh, as this member, I mean, I think you described it well, you're responsible for part of the flow and responsible for the flow. I think this, these instruments uh, can be used also to allow the creation of something that we might call the diffuse university. Uh, I mean, my experience uh, with working with social movements and the way in which they kind of tend to replicate uh, the structures of universities' learning, uh, they organize seminars, uh, workshops, uh, uh, conferences, reading groups, so, you know, I've seen that uh, quite, quite a lot. I, I think there is already a kind of diffuse university out there. Uh, there is already a kind of social study 
you know, as you called it, at work, uh, which has uh, to do with all kinds of groups. We remember, of course, all the studies about uh, the gay activists working on AIDS and the way in which their social studies actively impacted on the change of policy and also new drugs research. But we're seeing that everywhere. In the city of Naples, where I, where I live, uh, a lot of that study went into in the environmental crisis. You know, went into the kind of knowledge about the impact of toxic waste being dumped on uh, agricultural land uh, in the early uh, 2000. There were social studies. Again, university professors, but also you know, precarious university workers were very much involved into that. So I think that this kind of uh, technologies can also be used to uh, create and implement a kind of diffuse, uh, the diffusion of the critical tasks of the university across society. Uh, it's not, you know, we don't need just to be organizing courses uh, or uh, in a structural way, in, for, you know, for degree purposes. Uh, there's all kinds of social study going on uh, in society already, where already many of us are participating. So how do you uh, use also technologies to help, uh, uh, to help that, you know, to make it responsible to local conditions, but also to kind of make it connected. And finally, uh, I think that uh, uh, the relation, that, that is, uh, and that's related to what I said before, uh, this is related more to my research, uh, the rise of social media, uh, I think, uh, which again are so implicated in our practice now, uh, has led to an intense politicization of knowledges. And again, I, I think that something that a post-university as common for institution uh, uh, should be able to interact with, including their models of the social, but maybe this is uh, uh, part of uh, you know, a big uh, um, discourse. So, uh, and, and I would like to add also, this is not just about, as I said, about the humanities. Uh, it's also about the, the kind of natural sciences. As we said, uh, um, you know, in the environmental crisis uh, has also uh, uh, created the conditions for this kind of social studies to cut across uh, humanities, social sciences, uh, and the natural sciences. So this is, uh, you know, more or less what I wanted to say. Uh, I want to say that we can not only critique, uh, and we think we're becoming better and better at it, at understanding the logic which we're working under, but we can also try to articulate uh, new claims on wealth, on money, on investment and funding. But if we do not think about a different vision of what university would be like, more funding would be just channeled through more control. I've lived through the increase in fun university funding in the UK in the late 1990s through the Labour government and that came absolutely with a lot more control. But what we will, and I say we, you know, evoking an imagined community of people are interested in is to try to think about how to make these claims and what kind of vision can we imagine for a post-university as a kind of basic institution where study is diffused socially and not just concentrated within uh, the limited spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Tiziana. Thank you so much for your very uh, important paper which has brought together uh, practices of critical thinking but also materiality embodiment of possibility of change. I think it's very near to what maybe in the afternoon we will uh, listen about the university as utopia. Not so much as something which cannot attain but something which you have to deconstruct and trying to reconstruct according to vision a method we can share, not just something which we accept or we re-elaborate with the same means. We have to find new ones. And thank you also to have uh, brought to our attention the, the, the question of precarity in the university. People, precarious job, which uh, precarious work. And uh, they are there to, a lot of people are there and work a lot and are part of the university. They teach, uh, they do research, uh, they are paid not enough even to survive. And uh, it is exploitation, I think, which we can call it like that. And um, so thank you also to have shown us the possibility to apply the common fair to the university as a system and as organization. So thank you so much.